Okay, your usual host, Kim, is out today, so I get to step in. Um, and I'm going to introduce your speaker for today, Mary McMahon. Uh, Mary McMahon is a Butte Historical Essay, Society essay winner, and she will reprise her talk about her research into a walk of thon that offered a $1,000 purse to the winner in 1931. Mary first presented this talk on KBOW's Party Line in 2021. Um, Walkathons became popular during events during the Great Depression, offering entertainment and prizes to participants. In 1931, the event in Butte was held at the Temple Ballroom. Mary will talk about the contest and how the organizers ended up in court. Mary has been anxious to research and write about the Walkathon for years. She has enjoyed a very career in accounting, regulatory compliance, served two terms as a Butte Silver Bow clerk and recorder. She was active in community theater and pursues many creative interests with her family. Without further ado, Mary McMahon. Thank you very much. Well, first I want to thank all of you for, for joining us here today. And a special thank you to the archives for allowing me to come in and, and do the research I've long wanted to do uh, on the 1931 Walkathon. Uh, Kim Kahn was amazing in helping me. Because I got to tell you, I'll be honest, when I retired, I left uh, technology behind me and it didn't take long for it to go away. So <laughs> Kim was a big help. So she's not even here, to, uh, here today to hear me say that, but I, I will do that again another time. And for a long time, I mean years, I really wanted to see someone do a story on it, you know, a writer, an author. A journalist, somebody to, to do a story on the 1931 walkathon, and I was even better would be somebody that had family ties to it, but it never happened. So in 2019, the Butte Historical Society, which is now headed by uh, Patty Dennehy, um, did a, an essay contest, and I thought, okay, I'm going to do this. So I came up, and I didn't have a lot of time because the, the timeline when I knew found out about the essay and the contest, I didn't have a, a lot of uh, a time to, to do the research. So I spent a lot of hours in here um, digging up what I could, and I was absolutely amazed and thrilled at what I found in the old Butte newspapers that are so beautifully preserved here. And if any of you have a desire to do that, I can't encourage you enough to take the time. And if you've got somebody or something that you want to research, you can do it here with your city directories, newspapers, whatever. In um, the walkathon took place in a very difficult time. Um, we have to remember what was going on in 1931. Go back two years to October 29th, 1929, when the stock market crashed. And I want to tell you that this is where the walkathon took place, at the Temple Ballroom. Be Mary, yeah. would be possible to Dim some of the lights and you can see the screen better. Is there anybody here from the staff that. Mm. The right of the wall. Well, they might be. Yeah. Thank you. Thank It's probably made it worse, did it? Okay. We'll just take take a quick minute here and see if she can find out if she can do that with Kim not being here today. So where was the temple ball? It's down on Galena Street, right next to the mother Oh, the shrine. The shrine. The shrine yeah. temple. Yeah. And yeah, and it's a. So this is kind of how it was set up. Um, what I found is people were allowed to come in in the evening and uh, cheer on their favorite dancers. So it was, but I'll get into that mm -hmm. a little more, well actually a lot more later. But, um, so she can. Mm -hmm. Here goes Dexter. All right, so yeah, I think we want the
Is that better? Yeah. Awesome. Or you want okay, okay, that's better. That's good? Yeah. Or the screen yeah. off? Okay, all right. Thank you. As I said, it, it took dip, uh, place at a very difficult time. And um, not only here in Butte, but in our whole country with the onset of the, of the um, Great Depression. And this is a, a lovely headline I found. Market tumbles in a wild orgy of selling in one of the newspapers. And it, um, and it really was a terrible time. We know that the, the Great Depression, I think that's a bit of an oxymoron, but it's still called that today, um, began on October 29th of 29. And it sent the nation not only uh, into financial, but also industrial employment and financial chaos. Two years later, in 1931, the stock values had dropped 80%. The nation's industrial output endured a 50% failure, and our nation's workforce was unemployed. Now, a recent comparison of national unemployment of around 4% really puts a stark and disheartening light on 1931. Now, granted, our population today is much different than it was in 1931, but there were more than 12 million workers unemployed throughout the country. Just a lot of them were very disappointed. They came to view seeking work in the mines, but the work wasn't here that they had been promoted and had been promised. So it was a, a very difficult time. Many uh, immigrants continued to come through that time period. Uh, in search of work and, and in search of a better life for their families. And we all know how many countries in our, our immigrants came from, and I'm sure if everybody in this room can relate to that. So at that same time, let's see if I got okay, it's here. At that same time, there were, to alleviate the stressful aspects of the Depression, Throughout the nation, uh, believe it or not, ballroom dancing became an extremely widespread and popular activity. Even here in Butte and throughout the state of Montana, the big bands and big city promoters saw financial gain for themselves in putting on these uh, walkathons and, and sponsoring them. The, the, uh, they actually called a marathon dance contest, even though it was promoted as a walkathon. The contests were accompanied by real orchestras, became known as walkathons, and I decided in my research that I think those dancers simply became too tired to dance, and they ended up holding each other up <laughs> to try to, to compete because there was it was a competition. And so the challenge to survive the Depression continued. Now the news of Butte's impending uh, walkathon put Butte in a new spotlight, and people came here to organize the event. There were, um, well, they, they actually came to organize it. They conducted the auditions, um, and I'll get more into that here in just a few minutes. And to participate in it and enjoy what was already known as Butte's great hospitality. That was known. So, uh, I'm going to just flip here a minute. This was one of the gentlemen that was one of the promoters, and although it has a, a, a Butte-sounding name, Dick Buckley, um, there have been Buckleys in Butte over the years, but he actually came from either Chicago or L.A. as one of the promoters for it. Uh, and and was, he was also the master of ceremonies for the event. Sonny Hartman was also one of the people that came, and he is listed in one of the city directories uh, as be living in Butte in 1931 at 53 West Park Street. I tried to find 53 West Park Street, but I, I couldn't find it existing, so the ad addressing probably has changed since then. Um, the promoters regularly held dance contests in Butte, Anaconda, and Helena. Those were the three main places in the state that they held these dance contests. And 
the masters of ceremony, as I said, were Dick Buckley, Ted Mullen, and Sonny Hartman. Some of those surnames, as I said, have a, have a mute ring to them, but I haven't been able to, to tie them to anybody. Um, there's going to be more names as we get into the legal aspects of the, the challenge of the, of the event. This is the ticket for opening night, and this was printed in the paper. Admit one free. Now you can admit one free, but people that were allowed to come in and watch were charged 50 cents. Now, to me, 50 cents in 1931 had to be a lot of money mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, to, for families to come in and cheer on their, their favorite dancers. And some participants were known to come from other events to Butte to put on foxtrot exhibitions uh, at the Columbia Gardens. And free dances were held on Friday and Saturday nights. <coughs> and each Wednesday, there were dances at the Butte Catholic uh, church parish halls, which I found very interesting on a Wednesday night. I don't think the dances were something to do. I think more importantly, they were something to look forward to. This really wasn't much different, I don't think, though, from what was being done in other places to raise money during the Depression. I remember even back in the 60s when people would sit on a, on a light pole or a telephone pole to raise money in, in contests. If I'm seeing it, shake, yep or to see how many goldfish you could swallow without <laughs> suffering the consequences of it. Uh, there were things that were, that were done. In some places, they even held talking endurance contests. And we probably all know some people that could talk their way through a, an endurance contest. Um, I was able to, unable to determine just how many people auditioned, but because of the limited floor space, <coughs> with the way they had it set up, they only were looking for 20 couples. And there were, there were couples that came, one of you contestants that showed up, and they had to be interviewed by the promoters. A few couples chosen were leftovers, actually, from other marathons that came to Butte because they had heard about, about Butte's hospitality. The event took place, as I said earlier, in the Masonic Temple Ballroom next to the Mother Lode, which and that Temple Ballroom is still used today for Shrine events. Um, in fact, next week it's going to be used for, um, I think, the Shrine football team. Or, I'm glad yeah. to hear that you're going to be there with us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> oh, the, no, the, it will be. Yeah. The apron ladies yes. will be there, okay. but I'm not going to be able to All this right. year. It's oh. great fun. <laughs> Those boys can eat a lot of yes, food, let can. me tell you. <laughs> um, but it's used for shrine events, and it also is used for um, wedding receptions. And uh, it, it's just a great facility, and, and we're lucky that the shrine uh, temple is, is willing to share it with the community. So we do appreciate that. The real incentive to participate was the grand prize of $1,000 to be shared by the winning couple, to be split 50-50. Anybody want to guess on what the value of that $1,000 would be today? $20,000. Huh? $20,000. You're right, right there. 19, as of today, $19,020.33. A lot of, lot of difference there. Now, each of the contestants had to pass a med uh, medical physical exam, and were judged on their best suitable appearance, there, and be willing to perform in front of large, large crowds. The spectators, as I said, had to pay 50 cents to watch, and they were allowed to cheer on and make a little noise for, for their favorite competitors. But each team, each dance couple, had to secure a sponsor in the community, most likely a merchant or a restaurant, to support them. And what was nice about that is those sponsors provided those people clothing, food, and refreshments for the duration of the dance -a -thon. I want to talk about a little bit about um, the rules that they had to follow. You're not going to be able to read that, but I will explain them to you. These are the rules that were set up by the judges and the organizers. There were actually separate quarters for boys and girls on opposite sides of the ballroom. 
Cots were set up for one 15-minute rest period each hour. A nurse and one or two doctors were always in attendance. John, they could have used you. <laughs> if a, this one just made me cringe. If a bad toothache developed, a dentist would come in and pull it while they continued to dance. <laughs> Beauticians would come in and they would fix the hair of the women. Now if you think back to the wave, finger wave curls that the ladies wore in those days, um, yeah, that would be an interesting thing just to observe. Showers were provided and they had to be taken during those 15 minute breaks. Spectators were allowed, but not until after 6 p.m. because this went around the clock. Uh, underage spectators were allowed, but they had to be supervised by an adult or preferably their own parents. Now, dancers ate a variety of foods during the time that they were dancing, but one daily meal had to include celery sticks and carrot sticks because they were both supposedly good for nerves. Local restaurants provided one big meal a day to all the dancers, but they had to be eaten while they were still in motion. Restroom breaks, showers, and changing their attire were all done during the breaks. <laughs> and their, um, a trainer was on this gentleman right here, where Frank uh, Mitchell was on site to help with leg cramps. Uh, anybody want to guess what they did to help them alleviate their leg cramps? Quite well, cigarettes? Mas mas no, not cigarettes. <laughs> um, massage and ice water. They would stand in the ice water. Yeah. All couples were required to take their breaks at the same time, so as not to disrupt the flow of, of the event. Now, if you fell asleep and couldn't be awakened, trainers would stand you in a container of <laughs> ice water. <laughs> now, if that effort failed, you were eliminated yeah. from the contest. You're up. <laughs> So finally, after all of this prep and the interviews and the training and everything, on the evening of Friday, April 24, 1931, the Butte Walkathon was underway. I found absolutely no reference as to how long the promoters, the dancers, or God forbid their parents thought this thing might go on. <laughs> but it was unbelievable. So think about it, 91 years ago right now, in June, the walkathon was still going on from June 26th uh, to a later date. <laughs> Tell the bulge in a bit. Um, I believe that everybody that participated in this event showed a dogged determination combined with sheer will to survive the depression. It provided, uh, provided them all a challenge to survive a very difficult time. It didn't take long, however, for some legal residents to file complaints with authorities just three weeks into the event. On May 15th, the operators were given orders to shut it down as a, quote, common nuisance, end quote. The next day, the county attorney, who at that time was a gentleman by the name of uh, Justin Berkwin, filed the first legal complaint, the first legal complaint, in district court seeking to permanently close the walkathon down. Now, charges were filed against the two promoters and all three MCs of the event in Justice Court, but all five ended up being released on $100 bonds pending hearings which were scheduled the following week. It was, this was done after an inspection was conducted by Sheriff Larry Weir under Sheriff James Peoples, another familiar Butte name, and County Attorney Berkwin. The county health officer, Pat Holland at the time, also testified the temple was not being used in a sanitary manner. Complaints continued from residents of the immediate area of noise at night, late at night. Some folks even informed the authorities 
that it was a common sight to see what they called promiscuous drinking in and out of the temple. Others reported seeing juveniles in the temple at late hours. And as I stated earlier, anyone under 18 were supposed to be supervised for, by an adult or their parents. Mr. Beckman, one of the promoters, countered that he and his employees had called the police on numerous occasions <clears throat> to eject drinkers and unruly observers to the event. Uh, he had secured, he had done the right thing though. He had gone to the county and he had gotten, or the city, and they had gotten the permit that he needed to hold this event. And he was making a real effort to comply with all of the regulations. Complaints continued, however, because it, because it was so close to two schools and churches. Complaints were supported by peace officers and the director of the YMCA. And that's the YMCA that we know is still standing, the old YMCA on the corner of Park and Washington. The county attorney, Mr. Berkman, planned to bring at least 50 witnesses to court claiming a nuisance existed. And Judge Riley issued an order to show just cause. Now early the next day, which was by the end of May 17th, the two promoters, three MCs, and a local radio broadcaster, I don't think it was Ron Davis, who had been brought, I'm glad he's not here to hear me say that, broadcasting live from the temple, and a former contestant were all arrested by Sheriff Weir and his deputies. But before the noon, the very same day, they were all released on habeas corpus writs that were issued by Judge Carroll and bonds were issued at $100 apiece. The habeas corpus writ, and I, I gotta be honest, I had to research just to see exactly what that was. Basically, or historically, it's an important legal instrument to safeguard individual freedom against arbitrary executive power. And I'm not sure if it's still used today, um, as a post-conviction remedy for state or federal prisoners, but it may be suspended in the event of a rebellion or an invasion. The officers argued that the arrests were made due to a violation of, okay, um, a violation of a law that banned music hall entertainment after midnight on any given Saturday. Now those were released before Justice of the Peace McNamara, and the second charge against them was scheduled before Judge Frank Riley. So as you can see with all these names, this went through the court system that was in place. I mean, it went from one to another, back, forth. The hearing before Judge Riley had more than 25 subpoenaed witnesses to testify for the state, including school principals, Catholic priests, ministers, and even nuns who resided in the, in the neighborhood. The uh, View Ministerial Association stood firm that the walkathon was an immoral exploitation of personality and character of not only the, the participants, but also the spectators. Then on May 20th, Judge Riley got real bold and he sustained a motion by the defense to quash a complaint by County Attorney Berkwood and request that the, the event be designated a nuisance and also against Berkman's request for a restraining order to shut it down. Judge Riley held firm on his opinion that a county attorney in Montana was not the proper person to file such an action. He stated that a property owner in the vicinity or a person who lives there whose peace and quiet is disturbed by such an event um, could be done, but not the county attorney in relation to his stated duties under law. So with Riley's ruling, County Attorney Berkman responded saying, and I'm quoting him here, the ruling in effect means that a county officer cannot stop the walkathon as a nuisance and announced that his, meaning Berkman's, present actions would be withdrawn because of the decision by Judge Riley. So as a result, the dancing, albeit more walking than dancing at that point, continued on and on and on. Families of the competitors continued to come in in the evenings after 6 p.m. 
uh, to watch and cheer for their, their favorite contestants. Some brought lunches, staying into the wee hours of the morning. And even with all the challenges that had been presented to that point in time, the dancing never stopped. In the end, after 69 days and four hours of dancing, walking, holding each other up, and even avoiding obstacles on the dance floor, there were but two couples left, and still in it to win it, as the saying goes today. <laughs> At 4 o'clock a.m. on July 2nd, after 31, or, I'm sorry, 1931, after 69 days and four hours, or 1,660 hours, the two remaining couples compromised and decided they were all ready to put it away and that they would share and split the $1,000. So they, the last four people each got $250. That $250 equates to a mere 15 cents per hour for their efforts. <laughs> See, I think there's a... Another one here I want to show you. Where did you go? Uh oh, what did you do with it? Oh, there it is. Okay, this is the headline that was in the paper the day <laughs> after the event. <laughs> 50 cents. Weary dogs at rest. Now, as I said, the $1,000 would be worth over $19,000 today. The 250 that each of the four people got today would be worth $4,755. The 15 cents per hour that they actually realized in the end would be worth $2.43 today. This, was, this appeared in the uh, evening edition of the Butte Daily Post, and it did not include, unfortunately, the total number of rest periods or their duration, um, but the headline did read, as you can see, walk up honors, cash in, weary dogs, at rest, they split the paw and, and draw 15 cents. So I want to tell you a little bit of why I've personally been so interested in this over the years. I have a family history with the walk -a I knew about the event having heard about it. Uh, as a, My mother, who was a young woman that had grown up in Butte, she was the daughter of Polish immigrants. And um, so she had talked about it. And she loved to dance, and I loved watching mom and dad dance over the years. The Foxtrot, the Charleston, all of it. I mean, they, they, they thoroughly enjoyed dancing. They belonged to a couple groups in your lunch, uh, lodges that they would go and dance once or twice a month, and it was fun to watch. The problem was, my mother wanted to be in the walkathon, but she was only 16 years old. She was underage. She was six months shy of being 17, but even at that, she was still underage. She, like many others in Butte and, and around the world, country in that time, were forced to quit school and take jobs. Mother took a job as a housemaid and to help support her family. My grandfather worked in the mines. Happy to say he didn't die in the mines, but maybe as a result of the work that he did. So mom had to convince her parents <laughs> because she auditioned and was chosen. But when they found out that she was underage, she had to get her parents to sign a release. Now, I never understood the Polish language my grandparents spoke, and I find that unfortunate. But it, to me, I would love to have heard the Polish dialogue that went on in that little house down in Delaware with the students while mom was trying to convince them to sign this piece of paper so she could go dance for you know, for three months. <laughs> um, she did prevail, and Mom and, and Grandma and Grandpa did finally sign that release for her to participate. Mom always talked fondly about her participation in the walkathon, but she never, never talked about the, as the negative aspects of it, and now I understand why. Mom was a very faithful woman. She was a very religious woman. But she um, wasn't going to share with us that she participated, and God forbid, in, in, some, in an event such as this. Her favorite uh, MC was that Mr. Buckley that I was up on the screen earlier. She said he was a real gentleman. He'd entertained the dancers for all he was worth. 
He would sing silly songs like Ding Dong Daddy from Dumas, or he'd ride his bicycle in reverse around the dance floor to, to lighten up the event. And he, he really garnered a lot of party laughter from the, the events and the, uh, the uh, participants and the spectators. <laughs> Mother also talked about how difficult, difficult it was to stay, uh, stay really focused on the $1,000 award. She mentioned one couple from Anaconda even got married during the event. <laughs> and that was done as a, uh, an effort to try to get more activity and more interest in the event, in, in both in Butte and Anaconda. Mom said that so many uh, dancers were determined to win, to win that they were challenged to run around over obstacles that were placed in various places around the floor. Some couples got so tired, they got confused some even a bit delirious because of the lack of sleep. If anyone got frustrated or angry that the language got a little blue, they received a single warning. If a second warning was warranted, they were eliminated from the contest and escorted out of the temple. The four winners were, as I've already told you, my mother, Isabel Cuyaba, and her partner, Vernon Pickerel, who was not her original partner. If, if, one per, if one person got tired and quit, their partner wasn't forced to quit. They were able to find another partner to continue with. Wow. So, uh, so her, the, one, the gentleman that she won with, Vernon Pickrell, was not her original partner. The other couple included a woman by the name of Sis Sheehan and her partner, Brandon Murtha. Now, Mom, Miss Sheehan, and Mr. Murtha were all from Butte and Mr. Pickrell was from Deer Lodge. Mom and Dad didn't talk much about the Depression because like most people of their generation, memories weren't pleasant. It was a very difficult time. They did, however, ensure that we understood and that we respected the challenges and difficulties their families faced. Those discussions were difficult to comprehend in our youth. I know what mom told us over the years, but my research here at these wonderful archives, thanks to the essay sponsored by the Historical Society, shed a lot, shed a lot more light on the challenges of the Great Depression. I believe all of those young contestants were in a league of their own. As I researched the event, I've got to be honest, I honestly try to imagine the youth of today committing to such a challenge. Imagine, if you can, challenging 18-year-olds or younger with a contest with no sleep, no cell phones, <laughs> God forbid, no social media, con constant movement and dance motion for more than 69 days for a $1,000 prize. It wouldn't happen. It just wouldn't happen. Infl even inflating that to the eighteen thousand dollars, I think we'd be hard pressed to find kids that are going to be able, would be willing to take that on. I love my grandkids, but I know they they wouldn't do it. <laughs> There's always kids out there with no brains. <laughs> <laughs> my mother was four feet ten inches tall, weighed barely ninety pounds for most of her life. Hmm. There's my mother. Wow. Oh, that's cool. Nineteen thirty-one. Um, barely weighed 90 pounds for most of her life, and if we were dumb enough to tease her about her size and small physical stature, she was quick to remind us that good things come in small packages, but so do dynamite and poison. <laughs> we heard that a lot growing up. And the walkathoners, in my opinion, really were another component of the greatest, not only the greatest generation, but of beauty history. And I'm really glad that I took the time to research this and to share it. Um, I did a presentation with Ron Davis on uh, Party Line last year, and um, it, and that was fun. Got some good feedback from that, and it was just it was just an amazing experience with what I had known for sure from what Mother had told us, and then finding the legal aspects, the problems, uh, the legal challenges that the the folks faced in trying to um, 
to, to make it happen and to complete. But to go from the end of April to the early July, to me, is just phenomenal. Just and how many hours a day? 24 hours a day. <laughs> yeah. I didn't get any sleep. No, no, yeah, no. And no, they just, they held each other up. Don't forget the musicians that played. And they had, yes, and they did have an orchestra. They did have musicians that, that played there for them. Oh and yeah, so it was, oh it, it went on and on and on. How old was your mother when she passed? My mother was 74. And how many children did she have? Six. Don't ask me if we're all normal, John. <laughs> <laughs> the firstborn after the walk of the I'm trying. <laughs> he, he was brilliant. No, he was brilliant. He's brilliant. He's brilliant. And he's 84 years old. Wow. Yeah. yeah. How, so some years after that, she got married then? She and Dad got married in 1936. Yep. What a woman. What a woman is right. She was what a woman. Made wonderful cinnamon rolls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, she was. So what, does what anybody married me? Fraser. 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 Mm -hmm. My dad was from um, originally from Butte, but his dad got killed in the mines when my dad was uh, 18 months old mm -hmm. in 1906, and so my grandmother ended up giving the boys up for adoption. My dad was then raised in San Diego and came back to Butte to look for his brother. He always knew he was adopted, which was rare in those days, I think. Yeah. And came back to Butte to find his brother, but he found his mother still living. And she was a ragtime pianist in Butte's silent movie theaters. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, yes, it's, a, it's, it's been fun to, to tie some of these things together. It really has been. Yes, Jeremy. Attorney Borkman later became a federal judge, I believe, and some of his books are in the exhibit out at the Mining Museum, the law offices. Oh, it's up there. Oh, awesome. Yeah. And that's one of his Yeah, there was a movie years ago. They they shoot horses, don't, don't they? Don't they? Uh huh. Yeah. That was based on that same concept of those dance marathons. Dance marathons, yes. Yeah. They yes. had one in the Waltons too. They had the what? The show on the Waltons. On the Waltons? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. She would talk, like I said, she talked about the good things, but when it got into the negative stuff, she wasn't going to share that with her children. And there were six of us, and she didn't share it with us. <laughs> I remember doing the walkathons as a kid, about 25 miles, I think it was, every Labor Day for Jerry. Oh, oh, telethons. Yeah, no, we did a walkathon that went 25 miles, Harrison Avenue back to for the Walker MDA Village telethon though. That's where the money went. And you had it. it. You had people uh, donate like a dime a mile or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember doing that a couple times. Yeah, yeah. That's from Walker Village. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's all I have to share today. I want to oh, thank you all for for coming and you know, listening. Thank you.